I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I've got a lot of material to cover and want to try and leave as much time as possible for any questions at the end. So thanks for everybody for coming out. Let's talk about stupendous date tricks and how we can use Drupal to manage uh, complex data relationships, particularly around dates and times in a way that's going to be nice and easy for your content editors. My name is Martin Anderson Klutz on all the Drupal and social platforms. I go by ManClue. Uh, senior Solution Engineer with Acquia, and also uh, you can regularly find me on the Talking Drupal podcast. So, um, has anybody who spent any time working with dates and times in probably you know anything relatively technical can attest there are lots of pitfalls, especially as you get into more and more complex use cases, dealing with things like time zones, uh, recurring dates, and so on. And then layer on technologies that sometimes are opinionated in ways that aren't actually helpful. So uh, Microsoft Excel being sort of the butt of quite a number of jokes. Um, but the, the, the reality is that you know we all run into lots of these different exceptions and technologies that we sometimes have to fight with to get the sort of output or final result that we need. So today we're actually going to focus on a few different modules. Uh, a lot of it is centered around this module smart date. Uh, so you know, sort of full disclosure, most of the modules on this list are ones that I manage and, and have over time sort of built out to try and meet a variety of use cases that, you know, people that I talk to or customers that I've dealt with have needed. So certainly smart date as a way to try and, and emulate popular calendar software that your content editors will be used to. So things like Google Calendar, Apple iCal or Outlook. Smart date recur as sort of a sub module that will give you recurring date functionality. Smart Date Calendar Kit is a module that we're going to use to sort of quickly spin up our event management system. And then Date Augmenter API is really sort of a plugin system that you can use to, to make a composable way to manage the uh, formatting of the dates that you're going to manage. And so when you think about some of the popular modules that are available in the Drupal ecosystem for things like Add to Calendar, what they're doing is implementing those as formatters for your data and what that means is you have to sort of choose I'm either going to have the add to calendar functionality or I'm going to do something else sophisticated that I want to do with that data and so date augmenter is meant to be sort of an alternative to say let's have an API where you can have bits and pieces and have all of those actually working together as opposed to sort of having to choose between those. So we're going to see date content as a way to add content to individual um, elements within a recurring rule, add to calendar as a way to add some of those uh, add to calendar links. Uh, there's also a, a couple of others. One I know uh, somebody created recently around AP styles. So the idea of being able to, in addition to whatever else you might be doing with your dates, um, apply sort of uh, associated press standards around date formatting. And finally, inline entity form is the only one on here that I have had no role in, but I think is immensely useful in terms of optimizing that content editor experience. So today we're going to start with what I call a fresh install of Drupal, the air quotes, because there are a few modules that I find it painful to use Drupal without. So admin toolbar, path auto, the gin admin theme and gin toolbar are things that I use on basically every site. Um, I'm also added some modules to make things a little easier. So key save is a way to save common sort of entity or config forms just from the keyboard. Uh, coffee as a super convenient way to sort of quickly navigate around your Drupal backend. And then node type defaults as a way to sort of set things that I would commonly, you know, uh, change over and over in terms of uh, default settings for things like content types. So with that said, let's get started on our first use case, which is really just creating our initial install of that event system. So we, we're going to start with our fresh install of Drupal 10. We're looking for intelligent deduplication of data output, and I'll explain that better as we get into it. And also, we want an interactive calendar. So let's go ahead and start. Here's our fresh install of Drupal. And just to validate, if we go in here, we can see we only have the default article and basic page content types. And so let's get started with the install. So going into here, into our modules, we're going to install Smart Date Calendar. That's really the, the bulk of the work that's going to do. Um, just while we're in here, I'm going to install Smart Date Recurring because we're going to need that a little bit later on. So it's going to ask to confirm because Smart Date Calendar Kit actually installs a number of dependencies, but let's go ahead and say that's okay. And 
What it's doing is it's installing an event content type as well as some different views. And so now we can see with that done, we can go ahead and create our first event. So let's just call this a test event. Uh, maybe we'll set this for sometime tomorrow, uh, maybe 2 p.m. Maybe set the duration for 90 minutes and note that it automatically sets the end time based on the start time and duration. We could change the end time and it would automatically uh, update the duration accordingly. It has a checkbox for all day, but let's go ahead and set one manually. Oops. And then say, make that day, set that to 20, and we can go ahead and save that. And so we can start to see already how much cleaner the formatting is that Smart Data is doing on something like a date range. So Drupal Core uh, by default will out do the full output of both the start and end. So you know, this example would be Saturday, March 16th, 2024, uh, 2 p.m. to Saturday, March 16th, 2024, 3 p.m., which is certainly not the way people would naturally write that out in sort of common language. Um, the dates, it's done a little bit of deduplication, so we're not seeing sort of the, um, the year in both the start and end, but it's more complicated when you've got the day of the week in there. So what we're going to do is update the format that it's using so that it can uh, do a better job of that deduplication. So we could update the format that it's using. In this case, I think what we'll do is just go into our content type display and update which format that it's using and use one of the other formats that SmartDate provides as a default. So if we switch it from our default, which is a little bit longer and more verbose, to this compact version and save that and then reload our test event, you can see that that's much simpler and the deduplication is working much better because it doesn't have that daily week. So um, again, lots of different ways that you can manage this, uh, lots of rabbit holes we could go down in terms of detailed ways to configure this, but hopefully that gives you a sense of uh, some of the ways that you can set this up very quickly to give um, you know, very natural results. Uh, the other thing that I'll, I'll point out here, as we mentioned before, it installs some views. So we've got a list of upcoming events as well as past events, in this case, obviously empty. But it also provides the Smart Date Calendar Kit, this interactive calendar. So this is based on full calendar view. And so now we have a drag and drop calendar. So not only is it displaying it in a calendar format, but we can do things like drag and drop between days. We can also even go within a day and say, Let's drag and drop to reschedule what the time is and even the duration, all with drag and drop functionality. And we can just click back through to the node to sort of validate that it has in fact saved all of that to the database. It's not just you know, updating it within the calendar widget. So um, that should uh, handle our uh, first use case in terms of getting that event system initially set up, including its interactive calendar. So let's uh, tackle something a little more complicated. This is doing monthly meetups. We want an event that's going to repeat on the second Thursday of each month. We want to be able to set and display a time zone. And then for each of those monthly meet meetups, we want to be able to set a different topic, presenter, and have a meetup link. So let's go back here, maybe close a couple of tabs that we don't need. And let's go ahead and manage our fields in our event. Go back into here. Now, by default, when you enable Smart Date Recurring, it's not going to change any of your existing content fields to allow recurring date values that's strictly opt in because some places you may want it and some not. Um, it has this uh, ability to set months to extend, so you don't have to say as a content creator when a recurring date will end. And if there isn't one provided, this is basically to say how far out should it generate all of those instances. So we'll leave that at six months. The rest of these I think we can leave as is. And now if we go ahead and add a new event, we can call this our monthly meetups. Um, let's just backdate it a little bit. Let's say maybe these are going to happen at 6 p.m. and run for two hours. And we said we want that to repeat monthly and should be on the second Thursday. All right, so uh, we've got our recurring event uh, happening the second Thursday 
Um, what we don't have yet is the time zone. So let's go back into our configuration for the content type. In this case, we're going to update the form display. SmartDate has built in support for time zones, but again, for the sake of keeping things as simple as possible by default, and we know that many Drupal sites don't need time zones, it actually just sort of doesn't display it as part of the default widget. So just changing the widget to one that uses time zones is going to expose that to the user so that they can start to uh, manage those. The other thing that you can do, you know, obviously Drupal being a you know global oriented CMS has every time zone literally in the world as an option, but maybe your site doesn't need all of those. So let's say as an example, this site is only concerned about US time zones. So we can go ahead and select a subset of these. So Denver, let's go Los Angeles and New York as our options and set that and save that. Now, if we were to go back in and edit our meetups, uh, we can see now we have this time zone element as part of our widget. And here's our um, options that we chose. So nice and simple for your content editor. If you go ahead and save that. Now we can see that there's actually two different times that are displayed. So one is the, the time in the time zone that we specified, and then one is converted to the native time of the site, or it could be the user, depending if you were a logged in user. Um, it's not super clear right now because it, um, it's not really labeling why there's the two dates. You could, you could actually drop um, the time one if you wanted. That's part of the, the format configuration. But in this, in this case, let's go ahead and update the format to, to make it a little more explicit. So if we, we go into our smart tape format, um, we could make a new one that's specifically for use with time zones. But in this case, let's just update our compact format that we're using. Save that. Uh, the other thing, actually, maybe I should just point out here, I did that pretty quickly, is that one of the reasons that SmartDate is able to do some of the more sophisticated formatting is because it, instead of using a single string for both the date and the time, it, it has separate ones for sort of date and time. And, and that's part of the power of being able to do some of the deduplication de that it does. So now if we go back, now we can see that having added those tokens, it's displaying sort of that, that three letter acronym for the different time zones, which is going to make it much more clear for our users. Now, the next thing we talked about was really being able to present that additional information for each of these. And so for that, we're going to go to our date augmenter. So let's go in here, look for our augmenters. We're going to enable the API and the date content augmenter. And then once those are installed, we can see now that we have a new entity type in here called date content types, and it's actually created a default one called session. So let's go in here. Uh, we can see we've got some uh, default fields. So it's set up to speaker and topic. And so all we need to add here is a, we'll call it RSVP as the link to register. So we'll call that a link field. Um, we'll just go with the defaults for today. And now we can see we've got that structure. And now to associate that, all we need to do is go back into our event content type, in this case, the display. And when we edit the formatter, now in here, we're going to see this option to enable the uh, content date augmenter. And the, uh, the configuration for that, we can choose which bundle we want. Well, let's go ahead and speci specify the session. And you have a choice in terms of how you want that presented to your users. So the default is it's going to take them to a completely separate screen. Uh, but I'm a big fan of the off-screen uh, settings tray. So we'll set it to use that. Again, very simple to uh, configure. And now when we save that and go back to our monthly meetups, now we can see these links to add session content. So we could say um, maybe the upcoming April session is going to be about this guy, uh, from this guy, Manclue, who likes to constantly go on about how great smart data is. And we can add a link there and just call it our meetup link. And then uh, we can see, we could, you know, obviously clean up some of this formatting, get these under the same line, but I think you get the idea. That's just sort of basic site configuration. So we've been able to set up our, um, 
Our monthly meetups, uh, repeating on the second Thursday of each month, uh, set and displayed the time zone, and being able to set uh, individual topics, presenters, and meetup links for each of those dates as well. All right, um, moving on to our, actually maybe I'll just uh, pause quickly here. Are there any questions before I move on? Just wanna make sure everybody's good. All right, so again, let's, let's try and make this a little more uh, complicated. So let's go this time for weekly concert, concerts. Each concert um, performance should have an artist, and for that artist, we want to show an image and a bio. We want a description for the performance, as well as add to calendar links, and we want those to repeat on Tuesday and Friday. So let's go ahead now and make a new content type. So content type. There. So let's call this concerts, and rest should be good. The let's see here. I think that's probably all we need for the series. But now what we're going to want to do is make a new date content type for performance. So let's go ahead and add that. So let's call this performance. Go back to our reference here. Uh, for the performance, we want to reference, we want to have a description and, and then also reference an art, one or more artists. So let's go back here and say for the performance, let's manage fields. Let's add a description field. And call that formatted text. Make that long. We're good to go. Uh, let's set it to only use basic HTML because that's all our authors are going to need. And now we want to reference artists, but we need to create another content type for that. So let's go content type. And let's say artist and name. Save that. The default body field, we're going to rename to bio. And again, set basic HTML. And then we want to add an image. And I know that Core has added an image field for the article type that's default. So we can just reuse that field. In reality, we'd probably want to do some things like change where those files are going to be saved, set some you know, minimum and maximum resolutions. But for the sake of this demo, let's just go ahead and save that. And now we should be able in our performance to go ahead and create a new field that will reference those. So let's call this performed by. Let's make that a reference and reference content. And let's make that unlimited and only showing artists. All right, so I think that should be good. Let's go ahead now and create our first concert series and see how far along we are. Uh, oh, I know it would help if we actually associated, uh, reused our date field. So let's go ahead and reuse that. Uh, gonna say, oops. gonna say, want to make that recurring again. Uh, in this case, yeah, let's leave that at the default. Uh, rest we can use as is. And now let's go ahead and create a concert again. All right, so let's call our first one Acoustic Afternoons. Uh, we want it to start again. We'll backdate it a little bit. Uh, maybe we want it to start at 2 p.m. and run for 90 minutes. So we want it to repeat weekly on uh, Tuesdays and Fridays. And I think the rest we can leave as is. All right, so uh, we've generated a list of uh, initial list. And you can see based on, again, using that uh, default 12 month window for something that happens twice a week, that is quite a list and not gonna be super friendly for users of this information. So we can go in now for uh, updating the display and use something SmartDate provides, which is a formatter specifically designed for recurring events. 
Um, so instead of the user having to sort of, sort of parse through the entire list and figure out which ones are sort of you know recent or upcoming, um, it's going to do that for for us automatically. So we can say maybe we want to show three recent and or sorry two recent and three upcoming, and let's treat the next instance have the, it show that one separately. And now again we can use our content augmenter. In this case, we're going to switch it from session to performance. And we don't, it can do it on the recurring rule, but for this one, we're going to turn that off. So let's save that. Repeat our acoustic afternoons. And now you can see that's a much easier to navigate list for our users in terms of really it highlighting the information that's going to be much more useful on a regular basis. Now we can go ahead and add some performance content, sort of see what that experience is going to look like. Um, so we've got our description field. It's using an autocomplete for the artist, which is maybe not terrible, but it's sort of uh, the usefulness of that depends on that artist already being in the system. Otherwise, they've got to go sort of somewhere else. Hopefully, they haven't lost work that they've already done on the description and so on. And so that's where I really find it useful to use the inline entity form module. So let's just go inline entity form and get that installed. And now with that installed, we can go to our performance, update the form display, and say, let's, instead of an autocomplete, make that an inline entity form. So it has some, some really useful options, doing things like overriding the labels to make it really intuitive. So in this case, making it obvious that we're specifying the artists that are performing. And then we can say we want it to allow users to create new nodes inline but also be able to access existing ones. So by default, it's going to use an autocomplete. We're going to talk a little later about other options to sort of make that even better. Uh, but again, for the sake of our exercise today, we'll just use the default there. So we've got our description field. Now if we go to add a new artist, um, we can see we can do that again without having to go elsewhere. But there's a lot more detail than we probably um, need to, to do because probably in, in most cases, the defaults are going to be totally fine. So fortunately, Drupal has this concept of uh, display modes. And probably a lot of you are already familiar with view modes as a, a way to sort of display the content after it's created. But it, it also has form modes, which are sort of the same concept, but in terms of actually defining your forms. So let's go ahead and make a new form mode that we can use. And let's see here, display modes, form modes, and let's just go add a new form mode. So we want to make that for content. We're going to call this compact. And we can specify that we want to use it for artists right off the bat. And then the great thing is, and this is actually new in 10.2, as part of the confirmation message, it's actually got a link directly to go in and start formatting that. So it's uh, super intuitive and easy as sort of your site builder. So now I can go in, start to take out some of those fields where, you know, basically almost every time it's going to be totally fine to use those default values, but maybe we're not sure that we want to sort of completely remove those. And so now it's just down to those three. Set that. Uh, the next thing we need to remember to do is in the performance configuration for inline entity form, it, it actually has built in support for form modes, which is super nice. So now we can just switch it to use that and save that. And now if we go back to here and refresh and add our performance content, uh, go add a new artist, we can see that's a much nicer um, display. Lots less noise in there in, in terms of things that probably don't really need attention uh, most often. So let's go ahead and actually populate these uh, with some actual content here. So we can use this as our uh, performance description. Just use that. Grab an image that I have locally. So. some whole text. Again, uh, grab some content from our Word doc. And more content. Copy and paste for the sake of time. And so we've got our profile created, and now we can just save that. 
and we can see how that's um, being displayed there. So that's not terrible. Um, you know, we've got sort of certainly a reference to the artist, and somebody could click through to sort of see the full bio as it's listed there. Um, but we did say that at the start we really wanted to be able to have sort of um, a little bit of the bio and a picture of the artist in the actual listing. So fortunately that's not overly difficult to do. Uh, we can just go in, if we go back to our performance, update the display. Uh, so maybe we say we're going to say, let's visually hide the description and then for the actual artist, let's instead of just showing the label, actually turn it into uh, one of those view modes. So we could set up a custom one, do some really fancy things. For the sake of this demo, let's just use the teaser and update that and save it. And now you can see here uh, how much nicer that looks in terms of really having that description. Um, basically everything that we said we were looking for. So we've got the, the image, um, you know, the summary of the bio and so on. So let's look back here. The last thing that we said uh, we still have to implement is add to calendar links. So now let's go ahead, let's go back into our modules here and enable this time the add to calendar date augmenter. And now we can go back into our uh, display configuration for concerts and update the formatter. And now we can see we've got this add to calendar links. There are some uh, options in here in terms of how things will be labeled, how they'll be displayed. Uh, I think for this initial use, let's just go ahead and use the defaults so you can see what those look like. And now if we refresh our node, you can see by default it's only going to add the links to upcoming events because there's probably less usefulness to add something to your calendar after it's already passed. Um, but you know, it's using the label that we configured by default, it's out outputting these as text, but certainly, you know, in your custom theme, you could uh, output those as icons instead. Uh, also wanted to just sort of validate, it looks like there's lots of links in here, which could be sort of busy, but I uh, just wanted to validate that if we open this up in a, an anonymous window, that uh, anonymous visitors are only seeing the uh, calendar links and uh, nothing else. So it still keeps it, it nice and simple for them except for the, the out links, uh, sorry, the add to calendar links. So that's use case three. And then the last one that I wanted to show here is really around being able to create a daily standup. So sort of a you know standard of you know, agile teams in terms of having that uh, count or the event that happens once a day, usually as short as possible. Um, so we're gonna add an add to calendar link on the series, but not the individual dates. Uh, we want the ability to add scrum notes, and then we want to show the series rule, uh, the next occurrence, and then the three most recent, just as a way to kind of mix things up a little from what we've done already. So let's go back in. In this case, we'll add a new content type, and we'll call it meeting. In this case, uh, we can leave the body. Let's reuse our existing when field again. Again, making that recurring. Uh, since we know we're gonna have uh, daily repeating events, let's keep that short. Maybe we want to change the allowed duration values to have the default one for 15 minutes. Um, and we can go ahead and save that. Now, we also want to make a new uh, date content type specifically for adding our scrum notes. So let's go ahead and create that. And let's just call that notes. In this case, uh, we probably only need one field. Uh, we just have sort of a straight text field to be able to dump all of those notes in. So let's just call this text format text, again, text long. And again, I'm a fan of just providing one format option because it needs, makes the form nice and simple. So then uh, the last thing is gonna be for, uh, let's go back into, go back into our uh, meeting content type and manage the display to make sure that we've got uh, the right options configured here. So on our individual dates, we said we don't want the add to calendar link. 
So let's go ahead here and make sure that we're using the notes. Um, in this case, maybe let's switch it up and use the uh, modal as a different way to, to sort of be able to access that content. And now on the recurring rule is where we want to add the add to calendar link. And again, just to mix things up a little, let's show a couple of other things that we can do. So instead of using a text label, uh, we can use an emoji. Probably accessibility, there's definitely better ways to do that, but again, uh, <laughs> just to sort of show what's possible, uh, we can also do it in a modal uh, dialogue instead of actually uh, putting all of the links directly on the page. So let's go ahead and save that. And now if we go ahead and create a meeting, let's call this our daily stand-up. Again, we can backdate it a few days and say that it repeats daily. Probably we want this, let's say, 10 a.m. for 15 minutes, and we only need Monday to Friday. And now if we save that. Um, oh, okay, so we also did say we wanted the three most recent and the one upcoming, and save that. All right, so getting pretty close now. We've got our uh, notes content. In this case, we're showing the add to calendar links in here. Again, you'd probably want to use you know, some CSS to replace those with icons to make it a little friendlier. Um, but let's go ahead and add our notes content. In this case, it comes up in the dialog. And we just copy and paste some Lauren Epson in there to sort of see what that looks like. And that's pretty much it. So um, pretty simple. The, I guess the one thing to maybe validate here, um, we've got one add to calendar link for the whole series. And let's just sort of test that out to prove that that is in fact um, adding the entire series to your calendar. So if we open that up, uh, in this case we're getting a prompt from iCal to say um, adding this new event. Now we can see it has in fact added that for all of the different days in our calendar. And the other thing, the other way we can validate it is if we delete that now, um, it's going to say do we want to delete only the one day or delete all of them. And in fact, if we delete all of them, it really is sort of a single event across all of those dates. So a more powerful way, I would say, of working with, with recurring events, particularly for those at the calendar links as well. So I believe, let's go back here. So we've got our daily stand-up repeating Monday to Friday. We had the add, add, add to calendar on the series, but not the individual dates. Had our scrum notes, and we showed the series rule next occurrence and the three most recent. So that's the four different use cases I brought. Before I move into kind of the wrap up, are there any questions on sort of the pieces we've seen? Everybody's good? Oh, I see a couple. Um, I just got the calendar to show up. Um, I think I saw a screen where you had a full calendar showing. To show like, so, uh, just repeat the question. Okay, so the, yeah, so the question was, how did I get the, the calendar to show up? And just to verify, I'm gonna go to uh, events slash calendar as one of the screens that we saw earlier. So, okay, so we're looking at the the calendar view that's provided by the Smart Date Calendar Kit. So when you install that, you'll have this basically as something that's ready to go. Um, but it is also, there's a variety of configuration options. You can, can enhance this even more. So you can do things like have dates display in different colors based on the content type or on a taxonomy field, some of those kinds of things. So there's, you know, still more. This is just sort of a good baseline in terms of, you know, something to build on as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, for events or um, for a series of recurring events, are you, uh, it looks like there's one route which shows the entire series of recurring events. Is it possible that you separate them out so that each instance of a recurring event has its own route? Uh, today the answer is no. Um, so there, I mean, it does, particularly if you start to use the, oh, I forgot to. So the question was, if in a recurring event, it looks like all of the events are listed on a single route, and is there an ability to have different routes for each of those um, sort of, you know, I, I would call them like deltas in the recurring rule. So the, the way that SmartDate stores uh, recurring events is 
as basically field deltas. So if I was to make a recurring event that um, you know ends after 10 times, it's going to store uh, 10 field deltas in there in the same way as if I created um, you know, a single node and then manually put in 10 values. So in the database, it looks the same except for the fact that it has a reference to this other entity. That's the recurrence rule. So if you were to use something like date content, um, those are our entities in the system. I would say today, I don't know, like you could, you could use date content as potentially the glue between data that you're storing that's specific to those indi individual events and that's the part that you can access individually through those individual routes. Um, but unless you're, you're having um, data that, or data that's different between those, I'm, I'm not sure there's lots of value in accessing those individually anyway. So I would say like today that's probably the way to do it, but you know, I could probably talk to you afterwards and understand your use case better. Yeah. Yes. For like um, reoccurring events, could you add excluding dates to it? Or? Yeah, great question. So let's actually go to the test event. So the question was, for recurring events, is there a way to sort of exclude individual dates? So if we go back into our test event, and we can see in here, oh, uh, sorry, this one is not recurring, so that's actually not a good example. Let's go into our acoustic afternoons and edit that one and we can see we have this manage instances button that's going to bring up a list of all of the instances in the database and here's where you can override these so you can say maybe this one we want to remove excuse me in this one instead of it being at two we need to change that to start at three o'clock instead and there are also uh, visual indications here. So it's going to use strike through as a way to say this one was canceled. And this one is using italics to sort of indicate that it's overridden. Uh, but you can also see in the actual actions that you can perform, one that's canceled, the only action you can perform is to restore default. Um, for one that's overridden, you can either reschedule it again or you can uh, still remove it or restore default as well. So um, that's kind of the system that exists for those in terms of being able to manage, as you say, the exceptions to the, the overall rule. Uh, question? Um, yeah, the, uh, some of the functionality that you were showing um, that could um, show upcoming or show previous on top of the reoccurring events, is that provided, uh, which module is that provided by? Is that provided by the smart date recurring or is that an additional module on top of that? So the question was, um, the display of um, recurring events in a more specialized way that shows a certain number of upcoming and recent events, is that provided by smart date recurring or something else? So it is in fact, as you say, a, a formatter that's in the smart date recurring submodule. Uh, the other thing that I'll point out is that all of this is, um, all of the markup, it comes out of a twig template, and so if you wanted to override that in your custom theme and use a different structure, maybe you, instead of these being you know, details elements, you want something else, or you want the order of them to be different, any of that kind of stuff, um, you, know, you override that twig template and you know, customize to your heart's content. Thank you. Uh, was there another question? Okay, I think we're good. All right, so then moving up. I'm moving on. What haven't we covered? So we already talked a little bit about full calendar view and some of the other capabilities that we didn't really get into. There is also a module called Bookable Calendar that uses a smart date kind of at its core that is better suited to if you wanted to have like a system that could book like rooms or maybe, you know, like professionals like a masseuse or something like that. So it's more like um, reserving time blocks that can't be overlapping. Uh, that's a good solution for that type of use case. If you need to have registration for events, uh, so either you know free registration just for you know authenticated users, or maybe actually paid registration, um, entity registration is a good solution there. It does have uh, Drupal Commerce integration, so uh, that can be pretty robust. And then, as we talked about with the inline entity form, it defaults for you finding existing nodes using an autocomplete, but if you use something like Entity Browser, you can present more of like a browse interface as well. So for some users, that may be better. And there are obviously gonna be lots of other use cases that we didn't get to, um, but uh, as we wrap up, if there are questions, happy to uh, try and talk through some of those.
So uh, hopefully what you've been able to see is that we were able to address, you know, again, in less than an hour on a fresh install of Drupal using not a, a ton of modules uh, for fairly complex use cases and made those pretty simple for our content authors, uh, again, without writing any code. Just installed and configured some modules and uh, were able to set up uh, what I think are, you know, would have been years ago probably some, some fairly ambitious, um, you know, experiences. So, uh, last thing I'll mention, um, for anybody who's familiar with something called Acquia CMS, it's sort of our like opinionated version of Drupal meant to help teams build and launch production-ready applications faster. Uh, it does come with its own event system, um, but I have a tutorial pub on the Acquia developer portal on how to convert that over to using SmartDate. Even if you have a different um, event system on your site and you're interested in converting over to smart date it might be useful in terms of understanding what those steps look like there's actually like a dedicated drush command and some of that stuff but it's all in the t tutorial I can go back to this QR code if somebody uh, really wants to later but it's, it shouldn't be hard to find on the dev portal anyway so um, we'll open up for questions also this is my reminder to myself that I have stickers uh, if anybody wants some so <laughs> um, any other questions yes when you show the exclusions for like, the individual events, is there any way you could like make a rule for the exclusions? Let's say like it's occurs weekly, but every second week, it's like you know, there's that. So the question was, uh, we talked about the exclusions for individual dates. Is there a way to set um, a rule for exclusions, so maybe to exclude like a range of, of dates as well? So I would say that doesn't exist today. That certainly sounds like something that could be built. Um, if you wanted to write a merge request, you know, I'd be happy to review that. Um, the, other, the other question that I have had people ask is, you know, sometimes in Google Calendar you can set up a rule and then if you update one of the instances, it'll say, do you want to update just this one or like everything from here on out? Um, again, that's something that SmartDate doesn't do today, but would love if Somebody who has that as, as a business requirement wants to you know, collaborate on, on getting that implemented. I think that could be a uh, really useful uh, functionality. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, in the beginning, you mentioned something about AP format, like a module that you might recommend. Right now, we have our own custom one. It's not great. It blows up a lot. What would you recommend with that? So there is someone who, okay, <laughs> the, the question is, uh, there was mentioned early in the presentation about AP format and there being a module for that. Um, sounds like the person who asked the question has been using one that isn't great and blows up a lot. <laughs> so there is uh, someone in the community uh, who uses SmartDate and um, asked a question about AP formatting. Uh, the solution we arrived at was to say, create one of these date augmenters as a way to sort of parse the format before, after it's sort of generated, but before it gets, you know, actually displayed to the user to implement some of these AP, AP formatting rules. So I think the, the namespace that it's at right now is uh, AP style underscore augmenter. Um, today, I'm trying to remember, it may be just like a dev release. I think it had, the only thing that it does right now is basically it'll add the periods to the game and PM. Um, but I feel like with probably not a ton of work, the, the only other rule that I know of that it needs to implement is um, the AP style format says any, any month names that are shorter than six letters should appear in full as opposed to abbreviated. And I feel like that one's not crazy to do. So, um, you know, again, if it's something you need, absolutely jump in. But I'm, you know, uh, happy to collaborate on that too. Do you know if that works with like moderation time? Because I know sometimes you have the epic time and then you have like UTC time. Sometimes they don't work great together when you're passing in the, the string. So the question was, do I know how well that works with, was it time zones? Well, not just time zones, we have moderation times at the bottom. Like sometimes that date stamp is different and uses like epic time and when it's stored in the database versus like when it's stored in actual UTC time. There's two different date formats and that kind of have, like that's what blows up our custom solution. Okay, so it sounds like it's to do with moderation times potentially conflicting with maybe uh, stored times yeah. and that being the source of confusion that sort of blows up the formatting. So I'm not 100% sure to what degree, like it sounds like maybe you're using core date fields for that. And I know smart date fields, because they're stored as timestamps, um, by default will should should be less prone to confusion, I would say. 
Um, the other thing being, if if you're really concerned, you can explicitly store a, a time zone every time something is, is stored, and then that should should definitely make it easier to reliably apply some of that formatting. Yep. Any other questions? I think we're at time. Uh, pretty much. Yeah. Yep. All right. Well, I'll give everyone a minute back. Thank you.